My name's Kevin. If we haven't had a chance to meet, we're, we're honored to have you here. So glad that you made it. And hey, I want to give a special shout out to our online audience joining from around the world. Come on, church. Can you greet them wherever they're from? Thanks for being with us. We hope God speaks to you wherever you are. Glad you're part of the church. Um, Father's Day weekend is always an interesting one in the Miller home. Um, it, it, uh, in fact, this year marks the eighth anniversary of a Sunday when I challenged the men of our church to really show up and be intentionally present in the lives of their kids, and then I left one of my kids at church. So... <laughs> That's a real thing that happened, and um, I, as hard as I may try, I'll never be able to live it down. Um, every, every year, my kid's like, hey, Dad, Father's Day, remember when you left Adeline in a church? And I'm like, yeah, she's okay, and we still love each other, all right? Let's try to forget it. Um, but it's not working. I'm eight years in. And uh, I'm, I'm 16 years now into parenting, and... I'm, I'm still, there's a lot that I'm learning along the way, but maybe just a word of encouragement to the dads. Keep showing up. Just do what you can to keep being there in the moment. And you're going to get stuff wrong, and it's going to be difficult, and there will be challenges along the way. Your kids need to see you continue to show up at church, continue to show up with Jesus, but even just continue to show up at the baseball games and the ballet recitals and, and all of those moments, they matter. And when you get it wrong, because you're going to get it wrong, go back to them and demonstrate what it looks like to, to say sorry and to repent, right? We need to just keep showing up. So dads, we just want to say we're thankful for you, right, church? We're glad that God brought you here. And uh, I, I wish I could say that leaving my kid at church was the only dad fail I have. Um, time would not allow us to go through the list that I am working on currently. I can give you a couple other examples. Uh, one that is, will always be fresh in my mind, now five years ago. My son at the time was four. I was at home alone with the kids, which is already potentially dangerous. And I was downstairs and the kids were upstairs and I heard a thud and a scream. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I figured out who's, where's the trauma. And uh, then my son, he's four, he's, he's crying. He's telling me his arm hurts and I'm, I'm like trying to help him like beef up a little bit. Like, come on, man, you got this. And so I'm trying to help him be a man at four years old, you know, and maybe a little too lightheartedly trying to play it off a little bit. Now, I will be the first to admit the gift of empathy is not one that God gave me, okay? <laughs> Any dads relate to that? Um, so there's my son lying on the couch and he said his arm hurts. And so I'm just trying to like play it off. I'm like, uh, I don't think you broke a bone. I think you broke your drama bone. That's what I told him. I legitimately told my four-year-old that. And then I said, should we call the ambulance? Let me get on wine one one right now, okay? Uh, so I'm just trying to like kind of downplay it a little bit. So my wife gets home. He's still crying. She goes, Kevin, I think something's really wrong. We need to get him to the ER. So we got him to the ER, and it turns out the drama bone is connected to the collarbone, which he actually snapped. <laughs> so there's that right in half. Um, another dad fail of mine, uh, when we lived in Tennessee, we used to set off fireworks at 4th of July, like legitimate non-New Mexican fireworks. You don't even know what I'm talking about. Like you've seen them on TV or you'll see them at Freedom Celebration. But we could, in our neighborhoods in Tennessee, set off those fireworks. Like it felt illegal. It was amazing. And so we would, I would get all these fireworks and then all the neighbors would come out. And so we're just lighting like mortars in the middle of our cul-de-sac. This one that we had, I think it was called like the devil's spawn or something like that. And it's like this tube and you stick these mortars in and they just, I mean, it's like a professional fireworks show and I'm just lighting them with matches in the middle of my cul-de-sac. And so we're, we're all standing back and the first one goes, Whoo! And we're all amazed. And then the second one shoots, but the, the, the strength of the shot of the mortar knocks the tube down. And so the third one goes directly into my neighbor's wall in his, in his bushes. And then we, so we ran over there. Now, thank God, 
that when that one shot, the force of the explosion shot the thing back up and the last mortar went into the air, thank God. So we didn't have to call the, the, the fire department. But I think that goes to show all of those examples and so many more that I could give you that there's a reason I'm a pastor and not a paramedic or a firefighter, right? Now we can say we're thankful for our firefighters, right? Who literally put their lives on the line to extinguish fires, but today I wanna to talk about starting fires, not in a destructive vandalism way, but in a spiritually productive way. I wanna talk about allowing the Holy Spirit to start a fire in our hearts and our calling as followers of Jesus for the rest of our lives to fan that into flame as we pursue Jesus. So I'm calling today's message from 2 Timothy chapter one, fan the flame. If you got a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter one. This message I'm calling fan the flame. The idea here is the apostle Paul is writing to his spiritual son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy at the time was a pastor in the city of Ephesus. Paul, at the time of this writing, this is one of a few letters we have from Paul that was written from a prison. And this one in particular, of course, this is 2 Timothy. So this was his second letter to Timothy. And um, are you aware of the name of the first letter he wrote? First, somebody said it. Good job. Bible scholars over here. First Timothy and about five years later, 2 Timothy came. And these are Paul's kind of final words. In fact, it's the last of the 13 New Testament letters that we have from Paul and kind of his dying wishes, his challenge to the church, but specifically to Timothy. And there's a lot of things that he shares. It's a beautiful letter from the heart of Paul to his spiritual son. But this was written from a cold, dark dungeon in a Roman prison. A very difficult season in the lives of many Christians in Rome, but especially Paul and even Timothy as he was witnessing this wave of persecution. You may know the history, the, the history around 64 AD, there were these fires in Rome, and many people believed that Emperor Nero was the one who lit them. So to push off the blame, he blamed the Christians, and that began a wave of persecution. And Paul became one of the victims of that persecution, was dragged away and put in prison and executed shortly thereafter. And so these are his dying words, his final words to, to Timothy. And you can sense even in the opening verses of this letter the emotion that's going into these words and that Paul knows that Timothy's dealing with. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, Paul even references Timothy's tears. So this is a very difficult time, not just to be a Christian, but even to be a pastor, as Paul was, as Timothy was. And so Paul's writing to Timothy, and we, we got to just catch the emotion and the scenery in the moment. I want you to just think about Paul with the flames of Rome fresh in his mind, he pens these words in 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So some powerful words from the Apostle Paul that I want to just spend a few moments unpacking. Help us understand how these things apply to our lives. So I'm going to give you three just kind of take-home points. If you're a note-taker, jot these down. If you're not a note-taker, you should begin to become a note-taker. And I think these will encourage you. So I'm going to start here with number one. You have a gift, so keep it stoked. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have a gift, and what we're told here is that we are to fan it into flame. Now, before we dive too far into that, I think we need to back up and just start with the first half of the sentence I just, I just told you, you have a gift. Because some of you, maybe you're even in a season right now where you're just kind of doubting or you're struggling with some self-loathing or whatever it might be, and you're doubting that God could even use you or even wants to use you. 
And so we need to start with the reality that you have a gift. If you are a follower of Jesus, he has put something inside of you. He has, he has put a gift, a spiritual gift inside of you. Obviously, I'm talking spiritually, not like a, a gift with wrapping paper and a bow or as, our, as us dads wrap things in a bag with some paper stuffed on top, kind of wadded up, you know what I mean? That's not the kind of gift I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual gift that at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit has placed inside of you for a purpose. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 that you were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So he knew the moment when you would finally surrender to Jesus, putting your faith in Jesus as your Savior. And then it says in Ephesians 1 that at that moment of salvation, you were filled, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And it is at that moment that the Holy Spirit put a gift inside of you, something supernatural that God wants to use in and through you. But we have to start by just accepting that we have a gift. I'll give you a couple of scriptures. First Peter Chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 talk about this. 1 Peter 4, 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. How about Romans 12, verse 6? Here's another one. Romans 12, 6 says this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And it goes on to explain and give a whole list of gifts that we have. The common denominator of those verses and, and a number of others throughout the New Testament, two common denominators. You have a gift and you should use the gift. You, in fact, you've been given a gift to use it. That's the whole point of, of what the Holy Spirit put inside of you. And so it's so important that we, that we just accept this because if you're gonna use the gift, you have to accept that you have something to be put to use. But sometimes that's the question. Sometimes we're just wondering, like, what would that even be? And this isn't, uh, we, we don't have the time for the discussion of discovering exactly what that gift may be for you. Um, here at Calvary, the way that, that we would encourage you to discover that gift, we call it Life Track. It's a great way for you to learn what God has placed inside of you and what it looks like for you to put that to work within the body of Christ to, to serve other people with. So we don't have a long time to talk about discovering the gift, but I can tell you it's not some kind of like weird, mysterious thing like, like a Nicolas Cage film, you know? You don't have to call Liam Neeson with a particular set of skills to help you figure out where the Declaration of Independence is and, and find the gift, you know? It's not some national treasure type thing. It's something that the Holy Spirit put inside of you. And listen, if you're questioning, if you're brand new to the faith especially, you just gave your life to the Lord a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, and you're just wondering, like, I hear you that I've got something in me to contribute, but what would it even be? Let me tell you the place to start. Show up and do something, right? Like, you got to take a step and do something. You got to participate in some way. And there's too many people who, who spend their lives on the sidelines never doing anything, and, and Paul is telling Timothy here, fan it into flame, You've got something in you. Which, by the way, I love that Paul is calling it out of Timothy. All of us in different seasons of our lives need to function like Paul here, where we approach somebody and following the, the lead of the Spirit and just call something out of them. Like, hey, have you ever thought about, hey, you're really good at, hey, what if you serve in? Just call it out of him. Paul says, I laid my hands on you. We prayed for you. I see God's calling and gifting on your life. Now keep that gift stoked. Stir it up. Fan it into flame. And, and the structure of the Greek wording here in verse 6 in the original language when Paul wrote it, the idea when he says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame, the idea here is that this, was be, this would be an ongoing, continual thing that's needed in the life of a believer. So as you, as you and I are following Jesus, we have to understand that for the rest of our time on earth, we have to fight against our tendency to just let the gift die, and we got to keep it stoked. You have a gift, so keep it stoked. Keep it stirred up. Now, this is not Paul saying 
that Timothy had let his gift die. That's not what he's getting at. But what he's saying here is that it's a, it's a reminder to, to keep it stoked. You know, the, the idea here is that if we don't fan it into flame, the gift that God has placed inside of you for a purpose can over time begin to be diminished or almost lose some power in its effectiveness in and through your life. Think about it like a muscle that doesn't get used for a while. And although you don't lose that muscle entirely, over a period of inactivity, it can begin to atrophy, right? It begins to be very weak and almost at times become unuseful. And the warning is that we don't want to let our, the, the gifts that God has placed inside of us ever get to that point. And, and the warning for us, listen, this is important because too many Christians trip up on this. You got to understand, it's not that God's going to take the gift away. It's not that God, you're going to lose your gift. But I got to warn you, you may not lose the gift, but you can waste your life. And you could get to heaven with this fresh thing that the Holy Spirit has put inside of you that went unused and you wasted decades of existence on the planet because for whatever reason you never exercised the thing that God has put in you. You never fanned into flame the gift of God that's on your life. So don't waste your life. That's what I'm trying to get at. God's inviting you in. Too many Christians are misusing their gifts. And I'll tell you the most common way that we misuse a gift is by not using it. By spectating instead of participating. By treating the auditorium like it's a stadium and the chairs like they're the bleachers where we just sit back and eat popcorn and watch everybody else do the work of the ministry. Church. Come on, if you are part of the church, you've got something in you. You have a gift. Keep it stoked. Stir it up. Fan into flame the gift that God has placed in you. And we'll talk about some of the challenges, and we'll talk about some of the things that can hold you back. But it's so important that we get together and, and, and we're a part of this. Hebrews 10 talks a little bit about this. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, let us consider how to stir up, you could say, stoke one another to love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing near. The end is coming. And so this is all the more reason for us to not neglect this. Now listen, if you're watching online right now, listening to a podcast, watching a live stream, those are valid ways to receive God's word. But nothing can substitute for being in the room with God's people. We got to be with one another. Like how else are you going to live as a New Testament Christian than if you're in the room with other people uh, in, in, a, in community, bearing one another's burdens, forgiving one another, bearing with one another, all of these things that we're commanded to do in the New Testament, we need one another. And man, something powerful happens when we come together and we contribute to what God is doing. So don't be guilty of misusing your gift by not using it. You have a gift, keep it stoked. And this is the place to do it, getting together to stir one another up to love and good works. Now, if you need a why behind fanning the gift into flame, Paul gives us two whys in the next verse, verse 7. One comes, the first comes negatively, and the second comes positively. Let's start with the, the first. In fact, if you're taking notes, uh, you can write this down. Don't let fear extinguish your fire. He says this in, uh, in, in verse 7. He says, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So he's given us a why here, a couple of them. He goes, Timothy, there's a gift on your life. Don't hold back. Fan that gift into flame. 
the gift that we prayed for. It's there. Why? Because God did not give us a spirit of fear. And too many of us have allowed our own fear to turn into a fire extinguisher in our lives and put out the flame that God wanted to, to bring through our lives. Now, I get it. Everywhere we look, our world gives us something to be afraid of, right? Uh, you got the fear of heights, acrophobia. You got the fear of spiders, come on, arachnophobia. You got the fear of long words, hippopotamonstrosis squipedaliophobia, 26 letters. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry if we have any hippopotamonstrosis squipedaliophobiacs in the room. Or, of course, every parent's worst nightmare in the middle of the night, say it with me, Legos, right? <laughs> the worst, dangerous, painful. Like, there, there's so many things. If you, if you think about it, there's so many things for us to be afraid of in this world. But when we talk spiritually about being afraid, let's call fear what it is. One, a lie. Two, an invalid excuse. It is not from the Lord. Spiritually speaking, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Do you remember in school when, you, uh, when there was an absence and you had to show them like a doctor's note or a note from the dentist? Otherwise, it wouldn't be counted as an excused absence. Well, I'm here to tell you that fear is not a valid excuse to have an excused absence from the calling that God has placed on your life. And so at the end of your life, when you stand alone before Jesus and he goes, what did you do with what I gave you? You can't say, well, I was afraid. It's not valid. It's not a valid excuse. You know why? Because my Bible tells me God didn't give us a spirit of fear. So if you're struggling with fear, and, and get, I get it, like I'm not trying to downplay fear. I'm just trying to say it should not have power over you because it's not from the Lord. Spiritually speaking, there is no reason for us to live in fear. Fear paralyzes us, doesn't it? You just start to ask all the what if questions. Well, what if this and what if that? And I just don't know. And, and, and what are people going to think? And how could I do that? And I, I feel like I'm supposed to take that step of faith, but I got a million reasons why that might not work. And fear will hold us back. And we begin to question everything about maybe what God has already equipped us with. And I wonder what would happen if we overcame that fear that, let me remind you, is not from the Lord. I wonder what would happen if we overcame that fear with faith in God's provision. If we could, come on church, just trust God for a minute that maybe he knows what he's doing and if he's asked you to do something, he's given you what you need to pull it off. Like, what if we had that kind of faith in God's provision? That I, I think our lives would say something like this. Listen, I'm going to take that step of faith, and if I don't have it, I don't need it. But when I need it, God will provide it. And imagine if we walked with that kind of confidence. Imagine if we took steps that left fear behind, and we just said, no, I believe that if God's called me to it, he's going to get me through it. He's going to equip me for it. I know he's taking me somewhere, and I may not have all the answers, and I may not have it all figured out, but I'm certainly not going to let fear keep me on the bleachers while everybody else is following Jesus. It's time for me to get up and do something, because God did not give me a spirit of fear. Maybe some of you are struggling in a season or for a long time with fear. Fear makes us paralyzed. Fear makes us unsure of things. And I understand when God tells you to take a step of faith, believe me, I've been there. There may be a lot of unanswered questions. You know, sometimes we think we want God to tell us all of the things that are coming. You know, one way I think God demonstrates his grace on us sometimes is by sparing us the details. God's like, hey, why don't you just obey and I've got all the hard stuff, okay? Just trust me. Because ultimately, the plans for your life, you are on a need-to-know basis. And right now, you don't need to know. You're like, but I want to know. I don't know if you actually want to know. I can think, let's just, I mean, think, think logically through that. 
Think about the difficult things that by faith you have survived and grown through. That if God told you six months out that it was going to happen, you would have been paralyzed in that season. God goes, listen, I've got it. Just trust me. But fear can hold us back, right? We begin to question everything. We're paralyzed by it. We're unsure of everything. We have all these questions. So you may not have all the answers. I understand that. But I can tell you this. You can be sure of at least one thing. The fear that you're struggling with is not from the Lord. Because God did not give us a spirit of fear. So don't let fear hold you back. And I wonder what would happen if instead of focusing so much on what we don't have, we kept our eyes on who we do have. Because my Bible tells me in Romans 8, 11, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive inside of me. So what do I have to be afraid of? Anybody listening to me today? You got nothing to be afraid of. You got nothing that needs to hold you back. If you've got the creator inside of you, then come on, Christian, take a step of faith. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Don't let fear extinguish that fire. Now, now listen, he, he tells us, fan it into flame. You've got a gift. For the rest of your life, fan it. Keep blowing on it. Keep stoking it. And let me tell you why. He gives us two. The first is in a negative. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. But now the second is in a positive. Look at the rest of verse 7. God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of, say it with me, power and love and self-control. Write this down. Number three, you have everything you need to accomplish everything you're assigned. You know, maybe what would help you today is if you personalized these statements that I've give, I'm giving you. So it's not just generic about Christians, but it's about you. Write this, as you're taking notes, write that down personalized. I have everything I need to accomplish everything I'm assigned. If God gives it to me, I'm going to trust he's given me what I need to do it. And if I don't feel like I got it in the moment and I need it, then I'm just going to trust that God's going to provide it when I do. Imagine if we lived with that type of faith in, in, in God's provision. Now, if you and I talked about the way that God has gifted you and the way that God has gifted me, we would, there would probably be some overlap, but there would also be a lot of differences. And that's okay. Because the beauty of the body of Christ is that we're all different and when we come together, we can do collectively, exponentially more than we ever could on our own. Right? Like, I can only do so much, you can only do so much, but all of us together contributing what we're able to, what can't we do? And this is the body of Christ. So we, we, there might be a lot of things that make us different, but I can tell you at least three things as followers of Jesus that we have all been equipped with. And we just read them right here in verse seven. Power, love, and self-control. Let's unpack these here real quick. Power, first of all. Power comes from this Greek word where we get our English word dynamic or dynamite. So you get the idea, it's an explosive power. But when you think about dynamite, it might sound a little bit too explosive and destructive. I want you to think about this God-given supernatural power, not as a destructive, explosive force, but as a constructive force. Something that God can use in and through us to build and be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Because you guys know this, but we have to actively live this out, that we need supernatural resources to pull off our supernatural assignments. God has given us things that are far beyond what we are capable of doing. And I know that that's not what like the plaque at Hobby Lobby says. It's like, God won't give you more than you can handle. Really? Because sometimes my life feels like too much. Anybody? Like, 
what Bible verse did you read about that? Because what my experience and what scripture tells me is that God will often give us more than we can handle, so we'll go back to the one who can handle it. And I mean, if you wanna like collect, if you wanna correct that plaque at Hobby Lobby, just maybe say, God won't give us more than he can handle. Because that's really what it comes down to. There is nothing in front of you that you can't accomplish with the equipment that God has already given you with the supernatural power of God working in and through and overflowing into the lives of the people around you. And listen to me real close, church. If our world ever needed to see Christians supernaturally empowered, it is right now in this cultural moment. We cannot take these moments for granted. God has us here in this place with these people in this city for such a time as this. And our world needs to see God's power in and through us. You wanna know one of the greatest ways that we can demonstrate God's power? Love. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us power and love. Love, of course, is the... New Testament Greek word agape. If you've been around church, you're familiar with this word. It's this self-sacrificing, non-emotional, unconditional love that lays itself down for the people around it. No greater display than the cross of Jesus Christ. The creator allowing himself to be put to death by those he created, dying for those he created. Doesn't compute, in my mind, God's grace. No greater display of this love than right there on the cross. And one of the greatest ways we demonstrate the power and love that God has placed inside of us is by loving people that can't even love us back or don't even love us back. And just like I said, if if our world ever needed to see Christians that have the, the power of God surging through their veins, I'll say it about love as well. If our world ever needed to see people actively living out the love of Jesus, it is right now while everything's on fire in our world. Our world needs to experience the love of Jesus that plays out as we faithfully follow him. And so God did not give us the spirit of fear, but he gave us power, love, and self-control. Or if you're reading in the New King James, it says a sound mind. And I love this, because it kind of captures the idea of a mind that is properly prioritized. A mind that goes, hey, there's a lot of things I can do, but one thing I'm gonna do. Love God, love people. I'm going to pro properly prioritize my mind. And as I do my best to just get things out of my mind that shouldn't be there and make sure the right things are in there, as the Holy Spirit works in me to properly prioritize things, my life begins to, to, to look more like Jesus. And doesn't this contrast the, the chaos and the fear that often comes out in, in crazy situations that we find ourselves in. When we, when we have the Holy Spirit, we have self-control in, in the moments. And so the panic and confusion that often set in in fearful situations, those don't have to define our lives. Because God gave us the spirit of power and love and self-control, a properly prioritized mind. Now, these things are so valuable for us to have, but you have to understand that you weren't born with them. You're like, believe me, I know. <laughs> I got a lot of room to grow. You weren't born with them. They're not genetic, like your hair color, or your eye color, or your height, or your lack thereof. Whatever it might be, these things are not things that you were born with, but listen closely, as a follower of Jesus, when you put your faith in Christ, you may not have been born with them, but you were reborn with them. You were born again with a whole new set of equipment and resources that will enable you to, to accomplish 
every assignment that God gives you, everything that comes your way, because God knew beforehand that you were called to this life. And he has a very special, tricked out, mapped out plan for your life if you'll just faithfully follow it. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I was sitting uh, just yesterday in my backyard. I had a, my fire pit going. I love to do that most mornings because um, I'm a man and I like to burn stuff, right? Come on, any guys? <laughs> Why didn't, like, I didn't, six-year-old Kevin didn't know that 39-year-old Kevin would be able to just put anything in the fire pit, you know? It's amazing. My dad's not around to tell me not to do it, so it's great. Now I tell my son not to do it, but. So I'm, I, yesterday I was sitting there, I, I had a fire going, I was reading, and uh, I was just starting to just kind of get my, my head around where I was going today. Um, I had to leave for a few minutes, take my daughter somewhere, and I came back probably 30 minutes later. When I got back to the fire pit, there was no smoke anymore, there was no flames. Like, it almost looked kind of non-existent. Like, almost like it would be cold. There's no signs of life. And I, I didn't have the fire going specifically for this message. I, I just enjoyed it. But as I sat down, these thoughts came to my mind. I felt like this was an illustration of so many Christians. That at one point, you had a fire blazing. And then something happened. And for everybody, it's something different. There was a miscarriage. Your marriage fell apart. There was a temptation that you allowed and followed for way too long. There was a financial issue. You were diagnosed with the very thing that you prayed for somebody else to be healed from. And the list could go on, but something happened. And if somebody were to take a look at your life today, it would kind of look like my fire pit did. Like, is there even any spiritual signs of life? The fire is all but gone. Fear has all but extinguished the flame. And so I sat down and I was just looking at the place that the, the fire had been and upon further inspection, I saw a little red glowing ember in there. So I moved some things around and I added some kindling and within about a minute, the flames were back. And I just felt led to pray in that moment that God would do that in our lives this weekend. That where the fire had died, the ember of the Holy Spirit that he has placed inside of us would come roaring back to life. And I was just so encouraged by the thought that our God does not start something and then give up. But Philippians 1, 6 in my Bible tells me that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so if you have given your life to Jesus, there may not be any spiritual signs of life right now, but you have to understand that the Holy Spirit is alive inside of you even when you feel dead. And he wants to stoke that fire back. And so maybe the whole point of me being here today was to just remind you, God's not done with you. He's got something big for you. But it's going to take another moment of surrender. I'm going to pray for those of you who that's your story here in just a moment. I'm going to give you an opportunity to just lift up your hand wherever you are. And I'm going to just pray for you as maybe somebody that needs God to rekindle something. Like the ember is there. 
We're not talking about whether or not you're saved. We're just saying, like, you've put your faith in Christ, but, man, you just feel dead. You feel distant. God wants to rekindle that today. But before I pray for you, there's, a, there's another crowd in the room that I need to talk to. There's another crowd joining us online that I need to talk to. It's the people that there is no fire. There is no ember. It's cold and dead. You know who you are. You know why you're even hearing this message today. Some of you were just like, yeah, Dad, I'll go to church with you on Father's Day. Yeah, Mom, that's fine. I'll, I'll tag along with you. You came with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a fiancé or you came with a friend maybe begrudgingly, maybe you've been around church, maybe you've heard the gospel message, or maybe this is the first time you're actually hearing it where it makes sense to you. And if you're being honest, and this is the place for it, spiritually speaking, you are cold and hard. And I'm just here to tell you today that God wants to soften your heart. God wants to start something fresh. God is the one who lights the fire. And he doesn't want you to live distant from him. He's inviting you in. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of our sin, what we have earned because of our sin, is death. But that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that God loved us and demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, this is your moment. Somebody today was like, no, I don't, I don't know if I want to go to church. Christians have an agenda. Oh, we got an agenda. <laughs> Let me tell you the agenda so that you know that God loves you and sent his son to die for you and you could be forgiven from sin and spend eternity in heaven. That's our agenda. That's why we're here, that's why we do what we do. So that you could be forgiven and have a fresh start today. So I wanna pray for both groups here in this room. I wanna pray for you if you need just a rekindling of the spirit in your life. And then in a moment, I want to pray for those of you who are needing a, f- a fresh beginning, a new start, allowing God to, this is your moment to just surrender your life to Jesus. You never have before, and I'm going to give you a chance to do that. And then I'm going to give you a chance to make that public. But let me tell you this, before we get there, you're about to, there's about to be a struggle with fear if there's not already. What are people going to think? What about the person I came with? What about the, there's so many questions circling through your mind. Can I remind you about fear? It's not from the Lord. God did not give you a spirit of fear. Don't give into it. And so if God is calling you to lift up a hand and and make a profession of faith today, you got to do it. God wants to equip you with the resources of power and love and self-control. If you are, a, a person today who is, you, you would say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm doing my best, but man, life is rough right now. I'm in a season where I feel like that fire pit where the, all the flame's gone. I need the Holy Spirit to rekindle something in my life. If that's you, in front of everybody, would you just lift up your hand right now and I want to pray for you. Look at that, across the room, you're not alone. Look at this, everywhere. It's okay We go through these seasons. God, we just lift up. I lift up these people to you right now. I pray, God, for a rekindling in their spirit. God, I know that your heart breaks for those whose hearts are broken. And so, Holy Spirit, we are so grateful that you are the ember inside of them. And we ask right now that you would rekindle a flame. That you would start, restart what you've begun. God, we're so grateful to serve a God who doesn't start something and then give up. But since you've begun it, we believe you'll complete it. So do that, Lord, in these hearts today across this room. 
those joining us online, those outside, God, we just pray for them right now. And again, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to give an opportunity for those who need to make a first-time decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you've heard it before, maybe not, but today is your day where you realize God is calling you into a relationship with him. And you're ready because you've tasted what the world does. It turns out it doesn't satisfy like it promised it would. And you're ready to say, I'm turning from that. I don't need that anymore. I need a relationship with Jesus. I need forgiveness. I need a fresh start. Thank God we serve a God with open arms today. Maybe you never felt the, the love of an earthly father, but you can experience the love of your heavenly father like never before, right here in this moment. While our heads are bowed and eyes closed, I'm gonna give you that opportunity. If you're joining us in the family room, the amphitheater, balcony, auditorium, online, wherever it is, if that's you and you need to surrender your life to Jesus, would you lift up your hand where you are right now? And here in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to just come forward. I would love to lead you in a prayer as we celebrate this decision with you. If that's you, would you lift up your hand wherever you might be? I want to acknowledge that hand and then here in a moment, I'm gonna give you a chance to make that public as we celebrate the best decision you'll ever make. Don't give in to that battle of fear. You respond in obedience. If God's calling you right now, you lift up your hand and I wanna pray for you. See your hand right back there, praise God. Right over here, up here. Anybody else? Just by lifting your hand, you join us in the family room or the amphitheater. Anybody else? Just praying that God gives you boldness to do what you know you need to do here today. God, thank you so much for those who have lifted their hands and here in a moment, those who will come forward. Lord, we just ask that you would give them the boldness to step out and to make a public decision to follow you today. Holy Spirit, light something in their hearts. Do something in and through them that you couldn't, that they can't explain besides God showed up. God met me here. God met me in the mess that I created. Jesus, thank you for your grace that you love us enough to just open your arms. And I pray you would give boldness to those who know they need to make a public decision to follow Jesus today. We love you, Jesus. Thanks for loving us. In your name we pray, amen. Come on, church, let's stand to our feet everywhere. And listen, I know it's Father's Day and you got like some lunch plans or something. This is not your time to leave, church. This is a time to celebrate because we got some people who are going to make some life-altering decisions here right now. So listen, if you lifted your hand or if you should have, would you step out of your chair, wherever you're joining us from, anywhere on this campus, meet me right down here. And I want to lead you in a prayer to surrender your life to Jesus. This is the moment right now. Come on. Luke 15 says there's joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. There's a party in heaven right now. Listen, I want to give you one more moment. If there's anybody else today who on Father's Day 
wants to feel the love of the Heavenly Father like never before. We're gonna sing through this one more time. I wanna give you just a chance. I saw other hands. I'm asking you, fight back against that fear. That's not from the Lord. God has given you a spirit of power and love and self-control. You step out. You need to make a public decision to follow Jesus. Listen, it's gonna be real hard to live for Jesus out there if you can't do it here. So come on, come join us right now. Aren't you thankful for a God who loves us, who accepts us in the middle of our mess? Come on up, come on up, come join us. I just watched a, a father walk his son down the aisle. Come on, what a Father's Day that is, right? Here's what I wanna do, I wanna lead you guys in a prayer. This is something real simple for you guys to say out loud with me. But here's the, here's the best part. Oh, we got some more coming. Come on. So glad you guys are here. I'm going to lead you guys in a simple prayer. This is real simple. I just ask you, repeat this out loud after me. And church, we got we to gotta stand with them, right? Oh, we got somebody else. Come on. Church, they're not alone, right? We stand with them. Come on, you stand with them. So if that's the case, you lift your hand where you are. And let's all repeat this out loud as we vocally remind these people they're not alone. Come on, say this out loud with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying for me and for resurrecting. Now because you're alive, I'm alive. So fill me with your spirit, light the fire in me, and help me to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. At and just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.